there's so many beautiful faces out there in the world. There's so many beautiful women and you need something to kind of set you apart from everyone else. And so to be able to be a pretty woman and have personality, I think is what kind of has helped me, you know, take off from there. You ready? I'm ready. Welcome into episode four of Living Large with Mark Doner. Welcome into the podcast episode four of Living Large. We can listen to the audio form every Wednesday at 6 a.m. and on noon in video form on my YouTube channel. Today's guest is the beautiful, the lovely Kylie Ray. Hey. Welcome on to the podcast, Miss Kylie Ray. Thank you. I feel pretty honored. For those of you that don't know me and are just seeing my podcast for the first time, Kylie is my actual girlfriend in real life. <laughs> Uh, so we're having, it, it's a little weird for me because I know everything about you and now I have to interview you. Yeah. And, um, just for the record on fake life, we're not <laughs> dating. <laughs> is this your first podcast? It is my first podcast. I so feel special. Are, are you nervous? I'm sweating just a little bit. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah. So like I mentioned, guys, I know everything about her. Uh, but let's give a little backstory on you. You have 2.6 million followers on Instagram. Almost 2.7. Oh, okay. I'm sorry to cut you short. <laughs> and okay. you just hit 500,000 on YouTube subscribers. I did. I did. Let's talk about, let's go, let's track back here before I even met, met you, knew you. What made you want to get into doing Instagram? Um, so I actually had always kind of like a fascination with Instagram before it became like a fad of people posting pictures and getting followers and whatnot. Um, I always love taking photos and being like kind of the center of attention, I guess. You, you do like that. You do like that. <laughs> um, but no, I had kind of just done it just for fun. And then I was told by my ex-boyfriend that you can actually get paid on it if you get a certain amount of followers. And for me, I was your average college student who didn't really have any money in the bank. And it was already something that I love to do. So why not hustle and get the followers and get paid to do something that I love to do? And so that's how I kind of started getting into it. So you got uh, involved with arsenic very early, right? Correct. Talk a little bit about arsenic, what that was and how that helped you get to where you are today. So it's actually pretty funny. Arsenic is, I want to say like a magazine, but it's also like, it's a movement, I guess you could it's say. It's a movement. I don't, I don't it's know. A lot of it's a lot of girls. Yeah, and but at the time, it was basically what made it really adaptable for everyone is that it was called the magazine, but it wasn't your average like Vogue magazine where you had to be 190 pounds and mm -hmm. fi five foot eight to even be involved in with it. It was kind of, their motto was, if you're dope, we fuck with you. And it was anyone that could basically apply to be in their magazine and so it's cool because I think a lot of people really enjoyed that because you could be your average you know person from mm -hmm. Tennessee and, and apply for it and for me I reached out to Arsenic when I think I had like three or four thousand followers on Instagram nice and they were throwing a party and I just didn't even I just wanted to be a part of it like I didn't mm -hmm. even care to be there as like a social media person and so uh, Billy one of the owners of Arsenic actually invited me out and I actually was hired for the party so my job was basically to pass like out like a cocktail waitress yeah I don't know it was really cool I passed out um, uh, cotton candy and then I walked around with a squirt gun full of vodka like spraying <laughs> in people's um, mouth trying to like get the energy up and it's so funny because he just fell in love with me and my energy and just pretty much told me like whatever I'm doing keep doing at it because I have a great energy and you know um, I really light up a room so I just I went with it and now I have 2.7 million followers. 2.6, let me correct you there. Okay, whatever. Don't get ahead of yourself. Uh, but no, let's talk about, because uh, so you're my fourth guest, and something that I realized too in my first three guests and now you is you were born and raised in Los Angeles. Yes, I sir. think on my next episode, I have to get someone that came from outside of Los Angeles. <laughs> talk about like what it was like for you growing up in Los Angeles, and you're, you're still in Los Angeles. What is, what is it like for you getting big on social media and you know, s still like seeing people from your high school around in town. You know what I'm saying? Because I think for me personally, like in a lot of people that come out here, you kind of get to start a new life. For example, when I was in Ohio, I was scared to do stuff like this. I was very worried people would judge me and because it's not the normal path. 
and that's something for you that you didn't take the normal path, but you still see your people from college or from high school that, you know, they went to college, they got their jobs, they're getting married. What is it like for you to like be where you are and pursue this path with those judgments? Well, I think it's, um, I don't know. I think it's different for me in the aspect of that people like, I don't want to say like you, but anyone that's moving to LA, it's basically to pursue this career and be famous and have a lot of money and Mm -hmm. whatever it is, like they're coming to LA specifically for that reason. Um, So for me, I was never, I never moved from anywhere. So it's something that I've never like strived to be. I didn't move here for that reason. Mm -hmm. Um, But I mean, 100%, I still dealt with, you know, being judged and all of that part because I still, I grew up in LA, but for the most part, when you're not from LA, you say LA, but when you're from LA, I actually grew up in a suburb area, probably like 40 minutes outside of LA. Um, So taking photos like that and putting it on Instagram, when I first started, it was more, a little bit more risque than what I am Right, right. You mentioned Um, before to me that you posted your tattoo. When you first got your tattoo, if you guys are watching on YouTube, she has a a half sleeve on her left arm. (gasps) And you had a little side boob I showing. I did. For the first time ever, I wore one of those like shirts where you could see side boob and I like posted it. Can you just, can you just pull the mic a little bit closer so that people can hear? And uh, the first time I ever posted that photo had a little bit of side boob and I was super, super nervous. Uh, no, it did, it did, it did numbers. It, was, like, <laughs> it did like 200 likes. <laughs> um, but, but you said, you mentioned too that people in your town would say stuff about you. Not necessarily. Like even posting something like that. I remember actually the first po- photo I ever was really nervous to post was me and a lingerie suit laying down on the ground. And I remember I was super, super nervous to post it because I posted stuff that was was super conservative. Mm -hmm. Like I never showed my body or anything in that, in that form. So I was really scared that people were going to judge me and, and call me names or whatever. And I had someone tell me like, no, you're hot. Like you have a great body, post it, like screw what everyone thinks. Uh, and so I posted it and actually, surprisingly, I got a lot of really good feedback, mm-hmm. um, which made me feel better about myself. And and so, yeah, I, I pursued it. Um, but I mean, yeah, I was still a little bit nervous of people judging me because I did grow up in a little bit more suburb area. Right. Uh, but I also grew up with parents that um, trusted me and let me kind of make my own decisions, whether or not they were bad or good. It was mainly so I can learn from them if they were bad. Um, so I didn't have anyone breathing down my neck in that sort of aspect telling me that I couldn't post it. Um, well here, yeah, let's yeah. talk about that a little bit because you were the pre Instagram model days. And I think obviously, yeah, even since I moved out here from Ohio, when Instagram first came out, what five, six years ago, it was a weird thing. Talk about, did people ever call you names? Because you, posting a lingerie photo, posting a bikini, did you hear like whore, slut, like anything like that? Um, and I think times have definitely changed where it's like, that's not the case anymore. A hundred percent. No, I maybe, and at least not to my face, they didn't. <laughs> but um, I'm saying in the comment section. No, I actually surprisingly never, I think I'm, there's a lot of people out there that get a lot of hate comments and obviously I still get some, but, um, not, uh, not that I can recall that I never really got, really got that. Um, I still tried to stay tasteful, but mm-hmm. still, from what I am now, it was a little risque, but at the time, I still s- tried to stay pretty Right, pretty so let's talk, let's talk a little bit about that. So you went, you, you posted lingerie, risque. At what point did you want to shift your brand in the sense of kind of get away from the bikini shots and be more so focused on... Yeah, like a more conservative approach. What made what made you make that decision? So when I first started Instagram, I was kind of told that um, sex sells, and I mm-hmm. think it still does to some to some you know oh, of course, point. Yeah. Um, and so that's how I gained a lot of my followers. I had a very large uh, male base um, because I was always posting in lingerie. Um, and I went for this like very like Megan Fox ish. Right, you have vibe. a badass, very badass vibe. Yeah, and it's so funny because I remember the first time I met you, probably like two years ago. I'll never forget this when we had a conversation, and you were like, "Wow, uh, not gonna lie, but uh, 
I thought you were going to be a bitch. Right. And I was like, why do you say that? And you were like, well, you know, you have this like very intimidating look on your mm-hmm. Instagram because, you know, I have a very um, bright smile and I never used to put that on my Instagram. It was always like that stare, stare right, face. Right. And you're like, because you're you're a dork, like you're kind of a dork in real life. And right. So like, like oh a little, God, so, so let me give a little input on this, guys. <laughs> when I first met her, I thought oh, this badass chick, she's got all these tattoos, she's always looking fierce, like directly into the camera, like a badass. You have very distinct features, your jawline, your eyes, um, and you look very intimidating, in my opinion. So when I first met you, it w- I was under the impression, like, damn, this girl's gonna be like one of those badass chicks, she probably smokes cigarettes and like, like fucking <laughs> rides a motorcycle or some shit. But when I met you, total opposite, super girly, super bubbly, and like- Okay, relax on the girly. But you know what I mean? <laughs> you were a girl. But yeah. like you didn't come across like that on social media. And I thought to me personally, there was this huge disconnect with like who you actually were as a person versus what you portrayed on social media. Yeah, no, totally. And I think that it's so funny because once I kind of hit a million followers, I had this like idea in my head that once I hit a million, I was going to skyrocket from there. I was like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, like I can't wait to hit a million. I'm going to go so much faster after that. And it was actually the exact opposite. As soon as I hit a million, I kind of plateaued for a while. And I was sitting there for, I remember for like a month, like trying to figure out like what it was. And I could just kind of realize that there's so many beautiful faces out there in the world. There's so many beautiful women and you need something to kind of set you apart from everyone else. And so to be able to be a pretty woman and have personality, I think is what kind of has helped me, you know, take off from there. Um, you telling me to start getting into YouTube so people can see my personality, um, has tremendously helped me because yeah I people can see that I have a personality so you know it makes you that much more relatable whereas if you you scroll on Instagram and you see a pretty face you can't really connect with them on any other level Mm -hmm. other than them being beautiful right and I talked about this last week with uh I had Bear DeGidio on the podcast and you're familiar with him we talked about Instagram being this highlight reel where you only post the best shots and I think that that's something that I saw on your Instagram but I think now you you, you've you leaned away from that in the sense of you'll post a shot of you making a goofy face or you'll post an Instagram story of you making an ugly face and talk about the difference between like you first starting off and being this perfect girl on Instagram to like really opening up and being like, look, like I'm relatable. Like I don't always have to wear makeup. I don't always have to have a great photo. You know what I'm saying? So I, I love Instagram and YouTube for different reasons. Um, Instagram is kind of like what you said, my highlight reel. It's like me looking perfect and beautiful and, you know, in Greece with my champagne and right, like right. this beautiful, you know, life. And YouTube, you kind of see the more real me, the goofiness, you know, me without my makeup. Um, it was definitely really hard at first because I think, you know, as a woman and being on social media, it's extremely, extremely hard. Um, we're constantly getting judged, you know, whether it be we're too skinny and then we lose, we add weight and it's now we're too fat or you wear too much makeup and then you take the makeup off and it's like, okay, well now she doesn't care about herself. Like it's extremely, extremely hard. Mm -hmm. Um, And so when I first started, that was something that, you know, even me being a very pretty girl, I all have, like we all have our own insecurities. And so, um, being on YouTube and being able to showcase myself and seeing that people still love me, I mm-hmm. think has helped tremendously because, you know, I remember the first time I didn't wear makeup on YouTube, your YouTube, and I read through every comment. I was like, oh my gosh, what are they gonna say? And and I got a lot of really good comments. And so I think that's that's helped, you know, being relatable in that aspect and showing people that I too have flaws, like I've had, you know, insecurities, I've had acne, I've, I've had weight issues, I've, you know, I've been through it all, I'm, I'm relatable in that aspect, but it definitely took me a while to get there, but yeah, that's... Right, so you're the first female I've had on the podcast. Um, talk a little bit, too, about, I don't know, having confidence in yourself as a female for any females that are listening that want to get into maybe YouTube or Instagram. What advice would you give them to kind of move past that barrier of having their insecurities and then covering them up essentially? Um, I mean, like anyone, like I said, we all go through it. So the one thing I think is to not, 
like focus in so much on the comments you know like i said even though the comments the good comments did help it's that one bad comment that kind of sticks with you um and i mean i think it's something that we all struggle with but just really knowing that you're beautiful no matter what i think will help any any person trying to get into it but i know like i've had a few friends where i try and get them into it and then they look at every single mm -hmm. negative comment and so that makes them you know kind of retract and not want to do it but if i listen to every negative comment when i first started i wouldn't be where i'm at today so you have to just let that push you if anything right that's kind of been the underlying theme in my opinion on the living large podcast so far yeah. it's been not really care about what people think about you. Obviously care about what the people close to you think about you. You always want to listen to your family, your close friends, your loved ones, whoever it may be, but not necessarily care so much about the negative people because there's always going to be negative people trying to bring you down because essentially they're jealous that you're there and you and they aren't. Yeah, I mean, I, I for sure had people that I know that, I mean, obviously didn't say it to my face, but when I started Instagram or YouTube, it was like, oh my God. God, she's starting Instagram and YouTube. But Is that how like, they sounded? Totally. Yeah. Exactly. Because like they're from that. the valley, right? <laughs> <laughs> but like, I don't know. You just don't listen to them because now I'm I'm out here and I'm chasing my dreams and Right. So let me talk about this a little bit. You you didn't always have social media wasn't your main source of income. So now you're pursuing social media full time. That's how you pay your bills. You make money from social media. When you were first starting social media, because a lot of people think that they can, hey, like save up some money, quit their job, come out here, pay their rent, try to get big on social media. That wasn't the case for you. You lived at home. You didn't really make any money off social media until when, when did you like what did you do while you were trying to build your social media to make money? Um, so it's so funny. I actually sold ink and toner. I was a saleswoman on the phone that would call like businesses <laughs> um, um, for a while. I had that job. Uh, and I think it's it's so different now. I feel like social media, it's so congested, I think is the right. word. Saturated. Saturated. Yeah. Um, when I first started, I, I got in at a really, really good time. Mm -hmm. um, even at like 100,000 followers, 200,000 followers, I was still making good money. Um, but I didn't really know how to save and it still wasn't enough for like to quit my job. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I sold ink and toner until I had, you know, probably a million followers. And so is that bizarre to you to, to think like, Hey, a million people follow me and like my pictures, but I still work at Kinko's or wherever it may be. Yeah, no, it was definitely, it was definitely weird, but you know, I wasn't. I think it's different, like I said, for me. I, I grew up here. I also had mom and dad to that I stayed at home with. I wanted to save money. Like, I had a lot of different goals other than just trying to... I didn't have to... Like, for you... Let me back up. So, for you, for an example, you moved from Ohio to here. You didn't have mom and dad to stay with. So, mm -hmm. I used that as my advantage because I really didn't want to move out to L.A. and move 40 minutes away. Right and be giving this money away that I've been trying to save for. Well, let's talk about too, because you did do that. You moved to San Diego, you lived on your own. But when that, I was 18, that was way before But that didn't media. work out, right? No, it was too expensive for me. So yeah, so, so <laughs> talk about your failures, because a lot of people see, obviously, the highlight reel, this perfect life. What you don't see is that you worked at Ink and Toner, you had a job, uh, then you moved to San Diego and you failed. You couldn't afford to live there. Yeah, I mean, I grew up, like I said, in a very <clears throat> suburb area. I didn't grow up with a lot of money. I was, you know, a middle class um, girl, so to speak. You know, I got average grades. I didn't see, I went to fit him. I didn't really see like a university in, in my career path. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, everything that I've, I've gotten, I've, I've worked hard for. I moved out to San Diego when I was 18 just to kind of change up the vibe a little bit. Uh, it didn't really work out. It was a lot more expensive than I thought. You know, people say yep. you're going to move out and be able to party. And yep. I basically moved out just to work my ass off to live where I was living. Uh, so I moved back home. And yeah, I mean, I, I went through any normal person, what any person would go through, you know, having $5 in my bank account and not knowing what I was going to eat to working my ass off every single day and yeah i mean it was definitely hard but i had a goal in my mind so I, I stuck with it was it difficult for you 
So for example, me, I moved out here from Ohio. My, I don't have anybody here. Say I can't afford my rent, right? I have to go back home to Ohio. For you, it was a little bit easier. You're in San Diego. You go back home two hours away, back to Los Angeles. Yeah. Was it difficult for you to kind of like feel that failure? Was it, was it humiliating? No, not at all. Um, I never actually thought of it like that. I almost thought of it as like, wow, I'm being so much smarter now. Like okay. I can live at home and like live with mom and dad for as long as I can until, you know, like I took it as an advantage. I think that, you know, I took it as people like you having a disadvantage, not having mom and dad to go back and rely on. And so, yeah, no, I never thought of it like that. I try, I try to look at the positive in things. I was like, yeah, now, now I'm ahead of the game. Now I can save money while everyone's spending money on rent. Like, <laughs> so <laughs> um, that's, that's how I always thought of it. I never saw it as like a failure. Plus I love mom and dad, so. Yeah, and you have a cat, you have dogs, yeah, and a I brother. Don't know. Yeah, like I said, um, I've always, I've never had like a strict guideline where that parents made me go through. So I, I've always been able to do what, do what I want, come and go as I please. So it wasn't like I was moving back to home where I wasn't allowed to do anything that I ever wanted to do again. How do you, how do you feel about that? Uh, for example, for me, my parents weren't very strict. They kind of let me do my own thing, make my own decisions, and they would trust in me to make good decisions. I think there's a lot of kids out there right now that their parents don't really understand. Maybe say they want to pursue YouTube, they want to pursue social media. They don't really think that that's a career. Um, how did the, how did you tell your? I, I, you know what I'm trying to say like tell no, your parents like, hey, I want to do Instagram. Hey, I want to do YouTube. And how did they receive that? Um. So I remember even from a young girl, I always told. Uh, my parents said I wanted to be like a model and an actress. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it was before social media. Like I didn't have Instagram until I was like, what? 18, mm -hmm. like 18, 19. Um, so it was prior to social media and it was like that, you know, five foot eight, super skinny, one in a million chance. And my mom would always tell me that, like, it'll be one in a million chance. You need to be a nurse. Like you need to just go to school and be a nurse. But I knew that there was no way in hell I was going to go to school to be a nurse. Like I couldn't do <laughs> you it. You didn't like, like school, did you? No, like it was not my strong subject. Um, it, it wasn't your strong subject. <laughs> well, school wasn't point, a subject. <laughs> point proven, like point proven. Thank you. But uh, no, dad, dad was always really encouraging about it. He was always showing me different modeling websites, you know, maybe you could go here. Someone from work told me about this and uh, it was really cute. But um, no, dad always told me once I got older, you know, do whatever you want. You know, if you don't want to go, don't go, like pursue it. And so, yeah, mom had a little bit more of a difficult time when I I think my her. mom, my, my parents both, they were proud of me for making the leap out here. But I think, yeah, obviously they worried. Yeah. You know, they want what's best for you and this isn't exactly a guaranteed path. Yeah. And something that you've taught me too, and I want to talk about this, uh, when I first moved out here, everything was great. Everything's going well. My career exponentially growing on this yeah, freaking ski. Yeah, I never going at. <laughs> talk about, you told me, look, this career is a bunch of ups and downs and I've experienced that. Have mm -hmm. you experienced that? How do you deal with that? How do you deal with, you know, you, you, you getting to a million followers and thinking you're just going to keep growing, keep growing and then kind of just die off? Yeah, I mean, I, I remember because when I when I first met you, you were on a roller coaster going straight up. And straight it, up, top thrill dragster, the <laughs> steepest roller coaster in the world. Um, no, but it, it it's for sure a lot, a lot of ups and downs in this career, and it's learning how to maintain. It's they they like they say it's really fast going up. It's learning how to stay, you know, steady at the top. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't. I, I knew that going in and like I said, it's not like I moved to LA to have this be my career and I have to make a dollar because I'm yeah. not going to be able to pay my rent. You know, I think so. I think I'm very fortunate in that aspect. I've never had to. Now I pay rent. So I'm like, shit, yep. I better make money this month, <laughs> you know, um, you know, that's the hardest part is you might make a lot of money one month and then you might not make a dime for the next two months. So it's a lot of learning how to save and money management and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, I think that growing up, I've had my fair share of so many things of going up and down. So the way I think of it is even on my, my lowest in this career, I've 
been lower than that in life. So I try not to think of it like that. I'm always thinking, well, things could be worse. You know, I could have no money at all or, right, right. you know, or I could have no parents. Like there's so many worse things out there. And I just kind of convince myself of that, that even in my lows in the career, like my life is still good. You're grateful. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that's, that's something that's helped me out a lot. What's it like now, you know, paying rent, you have a car payment, you just got a new car. Yeah. You're paying, you're a big girl now. You're paying all that by yourself. It's so funny because, um, like I said, I, I didn't grow up rich. I, I grew up very middle class, but that doesn't mean I wasn't spoiled. <laughs> <laughs> um, dad, dad, uh, I'm a daddy's girl. So I'd always go to dad and I'd be like, you know, can I go shopping today? And it's so funny because when someone gives you money, it's so much easier to go shopping with it. And right. you can spend you know, a hundred dollars on one t-shirt. And now I'm like, I'm so, so stingy in that aspect. I'm like a hundred dollars on a t-shirt. Like I worked my ass off for this. Like I'm not spending it. Um, so it, it's, it's so much harder because you know, you work, you work so much and then you save it. And now like seeing it come out of my bank account and having to pay rent, I'm like, wow, I really am. This is what being a big girl is like. Right. And LA definitely isn't cheap from food, from rent, no. whatever it may be. Gasoline, obviously. No. Uh, how do you make your money? I mean, I know, but for the people <laughs> listening, because I, for me, obviously, I'm a YouTuber. You have the, the AdSense. Uh, how do you make yeah, majority of your money? I don't have good AdSense. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I make most of my money through b- brand uh, deals, brand partnerships on Instagram or YouTube. And so basically, because I have such a large platform, brands reach out to me wanting me to promote, like whether or not be um, clothes or earrings or tea, makeup, makeup whatever yeah, it is, yeah. watches. Um, and so basically I get to do what I do best and take a photo and promote it. So that's how I make my money. Uh, shifting gears here a little bit. You've been in a couple movies. One just released <laughs> The Row. Yeah. You have a scene in there. You were in lingerie. <laughs> you guys going to go yeah. check it out. It's on iTunes. It's available. Uh, my one line. You had a line in the movie. Talk about... Uh, because obviously my parents are very old school. I'm sure a lot of people <laughs> listening are very old school. Talk about having tattoos um, covering your body pretty much. You have like 17 tattoos and yeah. auditioning for roles. Do you think that affects you? How, how maybe someone out there wants to get a tattoo. Obviously tattoos are popular, but for me personally, my mom would kill me. Um, yeah, my mom told me she was going to kill me too, but... You're still alive. <laughs> I, still, I still got it. Yeah. Um, no, so, so, tattoos have always been something that I've been infatuated with. I love tattoos. Um, growing up, you know, I had my first one at like 16, 17, and people would always tell me like, what about your job? Right. And, you know... I would just say screw that like I, I want to be able to do what I love and I think that's you know the career that we end we get to do what we love and then kind of adapt that way so I always told myself that I wanted to get tattoos and if ever a job told me that I couldn't be hired because of them well then that wasn't the job for me so that's the way that I always thought of it because it's not like one day I just woke up and I wanted that tattoo it's something that I've always loved um so it wasn't like a sp- like one day, like kind of thing. But um, yeah, I don't think it's really affected me too much. I know for sure, especially nowadays, I think they're a lot more common. But growing up, they definitely weren't. So I'd for sure be walking and get some looks. But I don't know. I don't care. It doesn't bug me. I love them. I don't think it's really affected me. Maybe it has with (laughs) and I just don't know it. Maybe I've not gotten a role because of the tattoo. But you know, just like I never heard people talk shit. Maybe that was, and I just never knew. I you don't just know. ignored the haters. Yeah, I don't know. Talk about what is it like being a female in this industry? Oh, God. Um, it has pros and cons. Like, I. You get into the club for free. I was free. just going to say, I love being a female. Like, it's so. I definitely use it to my advantage. Um, you know, there's definitely a lot of things that I can weasel my way in and get away with because I'm a female. But, you know, I think the the hardest part is being super judged. Um, you know, like I first kind of tapped into, you know, wearing maybe something that's a little revealing. Well, maybe she's a slut or if, you know, gaining weight, it's like, oh, now she's gained weight. And there's you kind of just learn that there's you're not going to please everyone in the entire mm-hmm. world so you just got to do what you love and there's always going to be someone to hate so literally just do what you love because yeah 
something that you do a lot right now and throughout your career as an Instagram influencer is travel. Yeah, I love it. So how do you work that out? Because I know a lot of people, they want to travel and they can't. So I like to use my platform every way I possibly can (laughs) Um, because I'm so fortunate. Um, I love traveling. Like, There's just something about traveling. I think that growing up, um, I was so close-minded into different cultures and different beliefs. And so I think... I think traveling definitely opens your eyes to a lot of other ways of living and it kind of just re-humbles you and it makes you appreciate what you have a lot more. Mm -hmm. Um, And so because I have such a large platform, I try to, I'll typically just buy a plane ticket somewhere and then um, reach out to somewhere like a hotel or a villa that maybe wants to do trade in a sense of like, I can post something on my Instagram and I'll get to stay there for free. And then I'll usually try and reach out to brands then and say, hey, I can take photos of you and like your bathing suits or your clothing clothing and like this beautiful, beautiful spot. I like write up this whole email and if they're interested, they're interested and then the whole trip is paid for and then that's nice. Um, if not, I usually just pay for a plane ticket and then get the place that I'm staying for free, which is free. the accommodations. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, guys, if you want to build your following up a little bit. You can travel for free. You can travel for free. I love it. What advice would you give to a young 12-year-old girl that looks up to you and admires you on YouTube, on Instagram, and she wants to be a model? She wants to do these things. Um, I would say that anything is possible with hard work. Um, I was just your average Jane living next door when I first started. And if someone told me that I couldn't do it, I just use that to push me even harder. I'm the type of person that if you tell me I can't, I'm going to be like, well, screw you. I can. And Mm -hmm. then I'll, and I'll usually do it. Um, so use that as motivation and just know that, like I said, if you work hard, you can literally do whatever you want. And I've, I've been through so many struggles and I've never let that stop me. So even if you see yourself fail once, twice, three times, or however many times it, it, you, you fail, you have to keep going, you know, for me and you, even with auditions, like we've been told no so many times. Right. And I've even talked to my manager who he said, you know, people have gone three, four, five years being told no, and then they finally get that break. So it's learning that no matter, no matter, no matter what you're going through, just to keep going if it's something that you really, really want to do. Right. And obviously, guys, all you know that the road isn't just a smooth highway. There's got there's a lot of bumps and cracks throughout the the path to getting to where we are or where you are right now. And it takes a lot of mental strength. It takes a lot of support from your friends and family to get to where you want to go. And you definitely got to stay tough. And I think the one thing we've learned in the Living Large podcast is it isn't easy. And while you do see the highlight reel on Instagram, there's a lot of struggles that people battle. And you don't see. Yeah, even even people like me and you, like you, we, we portray this positivity, this highlight reel, everything's great, but we're still human beings at the end of the day. What's it been like dating me <laughs> on social media? No, it's been great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally lying. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, it's been really, really good. I've had my fair share of, you know, not picking good ones, so you can say. That's a fact. <laughs> <clears throat> um, you include it. No, yep. I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, no, y- you're wonderful. It's You push me really hard. Um, I've never had a boyfriend that was so supportive in what I do. Um, so that's, that's really great. And yeah, I know you trust me and it's, it's fun. So I get to travel all these places and while people freak out, how do you let her travel by herself? Right. But, uh, no, it's been fun. We get well, how do you, how do you, ba- how do you battle? What's it like for you? I know we're getting personal and deep here oh God. And, I, and I'm interviewing you. Like, I don't know you, <laughs> but how do you battle having a relationship on social media, like portraying that relationship on social media reality? How does that make you feel? Wait, what do you mean? I don't understand the question. <laughs> Just like say we're in an argument. You're in our, ar- sorry, we'll put this third person. Okay. You're in an argument with your boyfriend, okay. but you know, you still have to go to work. Essentially, you have to show up with a smile. No, I think you're so much better than that than I am <laughs> because I, I wear my emotions on my sleeve. So it's, if I get in a fight, it's really hard for me to like put on a fake smile <laughs> and pretend like nothing's wrong. 
Um, you'll definitely know that something's wrong with me. It's definitely hard, but I think it's easy in this in this um, uh, world that we're living in, like our career path, because right. I don't have to go to a nine to five, so I don't have to fake smile. You know, maybe it's like a vlog for you, but I'll just. I'll leave. I'll find my, right. you know, myself out of it somehow. So I, I think I'm fortunate in that aspect. But um, yeah, no, I, I, it's definitely hard sometimes. But do you think personally, pursuing your dreams, pursuing social media, pursuing acting, do you think it's easier in a relationship or being single? Um, I think it depends on your partner, a hundred percent. If you would have asked me in my last relationship, a hundred thousand percent, I would have said single. Um, I think it takes a lot of trust and a lot of willpower. I think it takes um, someone that builds you up, and I think it's it's definitely easier. I think having you in, I feel like people could say both ways. Being the other partner being out of the, you know industry yeah, versus yeah. in the industry. Um, but I think it's great that you're in the same industry because you understand. Um, so we're able to, you know, kind of take that moving forward. But um, with you and I, I think it's definitely easier because I trust you with everything. So if I didn't trust you, oh my God, it'd be so hard. Do you think that, cause you, you've been in, you were in a relationship prior to me when you first started Instagram yeah. and then you had a little bit of a time period where you were single. What was that time period like? Because you can, in my opinion, you you could focus 100% on Kylie Ray. Yeah. Um, yeah, I usually focus when I'm single on myself. But um, I don't know. Like, I don't think it was any, any different than how I am now. I think that it was a lot different from my last relationship being single because I was able to take on things that he wouldn't allow me to, like, versus... Um, you know, any traveling with a bunch of girls like I wouldn't have been able to do or, you know, taking that movie where I was in lingerie, I wouldn't have been able to do. Um, so I think being single versus now is kind of similar because you have, you know, trust in my decision and and you kind of allow me to do what I want and to take on that role myself versus you telling me, oh, I can't do that or oh, I can do that one. But, you know, I can't do that. Right. So I think that now being single is kind of like the same. I'm still able to kind of do what I want, so. Right, guys, and I think too, if you're in a relationship, and I think any relationship, whether it be in social media, whether it be in life, I think that the it's really important to find someone that supports you and what you're doing in your career, then kind of lives their life and you let them live their, their life and not really control what the other person is doing. Obviously be respectful of them, but at the end of the day, like, if I'm holding you back in your relationship or if you're holding me back, I don't think you should be with someone that's holding you back. That's like, hey, you can't do that because I'll be upset, you know? Um, that makes me mad. Yeah, or because I don't trust you or whatever it is, 100%. Um, plus, you're gonna end up not liking them for it, you know? You're gonna right. end up regretting certain things or opportunities that maybe you wish you would have taken. And I think that's one thing I've always kind of told myself, like when I'm 50 or 60, or even when I'm on my deathbed, I never want to look back in life and be like, wow, shit, like I wish I did that. Um, and so that's kind of the way that I live my life. Like if I want to do something, I want to do it because I, if I regret it, I'll be so mad that I didn't end up doing right. it. Right, and I think too, like, and it, it, per it pertains to moving out here to Los Angeles. I think a lot of people, they're afraid to leave behind what they already have, yeah, right? But 100%. I think any it's support It's making of, that jump too. Right, any support, may, say you're moving out here from Ohio, but you're dating someone in Ohio and you don't want to leave your girlfriend. I think, you know, if you have an opportunity out here that your girlfriend should be, be supportive or vice versa, if the other person's leaving, you know, make that long distance relationship work, but you can't really, you know, think about it as like, yeah, like you said, you, you could regret that decision that you never took that leap of faith because you were afraid to make someone else upset. And I think it's important, guys, in terms of relationships, in terms of living, to live your life, stay in your lane. Yeah. You know? Um, also, like, do what makes you happy. Like, at the end of the day, don't make any de decision off other people. Like, you have to follow what you want to do and follow your heart and what your gut's telling you to do. So actual factual it's what I live information by. here from Kylie Ray. Anything else you want to add? Ah, uh, just that I love everyone watching this. Thanks for watching it. I love you. That's it. That's it. What if they're listening? 
if you're listening <laughs> i love you too more power to you because i'd probably listen to it too although you should watch it i feel like i look really good today <laughs> You heard it here first, guys. Thank you so much for listening and watching to episode four of Living Large every six o'clock in the morning PST on the app CastBox and then followed up by noon post time in visual form, video form on my YouTube channel. That's episode four. Doses. Later. Oh.